Hey friends, I'm Michael Kingswood. It's story time. It's Saturday and it's Story Saturday. Uh, we are, as you know, reading stories of mine from around here that I that I wrote and I enjoy reading to you. In the last year or so, we've been reading these stories from The Great Challenge. 52 stories that I wrote over the course of a year as part of a writing challenge. And last week we finished that. Finished reading them. I finished the challenge a couple years ago and put out this awesome thick book of it. Uh, which is available everywhere good books are sold, but especially from michaelkingswood.com slash store. But at the end of the episode last week, I kind of discussed what we were going to do next going forward to the story Saturday. And I had an idea of what to do. And I told all you guys, if you had a better idea to let me know. And then I came up with a better idea. So we're going to hold off on Gloomvale 3 for a little bit and proceed with some older stories of mine. Because if you scroll back through the podcast or the YouTube channel, uh, you will see way back in the day, and I've been doing this for a number of years now, you pro if you go back to some of those early episodes, you probably notice that some of the audio quality isn't so good. So I got all these stories that I wrote re read way back then, uh, and I was never able to do anything with them because the audio quality wasn't good because was, I was still learned how to do this. So I'm going to redo some of them because I've been wanting to put audiobooks out as well as everything else. And uh, so that's what we're going to do for the next little bit here. So the first story we're going to do is a novella I wrote uh, called The Necromancer's Lair, which is a heroic fantasy slash sword and sorcery thing about a dude who's got a bounty to go take out the local necromancer who's been harassing everybody. And uh, yeah, came about... <laughs> <laughs> because I was playing Skyrim and down one of those dungeon delves. It's like, that'd be fun to write a story like that. And so I did. Uh, so we are doing this. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know, we did it a few years ago. This is going to be better quality because I'm better at it now. So sit back, enjoy. I wrote it. I'm reading it. You will like it. I'll talk to you on the other side. Gareth's chest heaved as he sucked in gulps of air. His heart pounded in his ears and he tingled all over with a mixture of exhilaration and fear. He leapt backwards, leaving grimy claws to scratch harmlessly along the front of his steel breastplate before he got out of reach. This thing was relentless. Gareth had hit it a dozen times before, each blow of his axe tearing out large bits of flesh and muscle, but it kept on coming. Even losing an arm did not stop it. The creature shambled forward, the putrid scent of rotting flesh leading the way. Its mouth lolled open in a brainless snarl, and its eyes shone with a ghostly light that did not come close to resembling life, and yet it moved. Ragged cloths, the last remains of its funeral raiment, Gareth was sure, still clung to its body in pieces, but were at best an afterthought, if such a thing as this had any thoughts at all. Gareth drew a deep breath and adjusted his grip on the handle of his axe. He wondered for a heartbeat how much longer he could keep hacking at the thing, before it simply wore him down from fatigue. Then it was on him, the nails, claws of its sole remaining arm thrust toward Gareth's throat. It was an awkward attack, as clumsy as the thing's stride, and Gareth easily sidestepped it. He gritted his teeth, and with a grunt that was nearly a shout, brought his axe down. The thing's arm went flying, cut off at the elbow. No blood flowed, there was none remaining in its body, neither did the thing seem to feel pain or slow. It stumbled forward, turning to face him, before launching itself straight at him, its rotting teeth its last weapon. Except for the stink. It became overpowering as the thing's mouth drew near. Gareth nearly gagged, only years of training stopping him from losing his composure. Would the thing never die? He recoiled and struck again with his axe. The half-moon of steel struck the beast in the forehead, cleaving its head nearly in two before lodging in place. The light in the creature's eyes flickered, and it shambled forward another half-step. Then the light went out completely, and it fell forward. It hit the ground with a sickening, squishy thud, and lay still. Ye gods, Gareth muttered, as he wiped his brow with the back of his hand. He took a deep breath and had to stop himself from shuddering. Well fought, my lord, said Hatherly from behind him. But if I may make a suggestion... Gareth scowled and looked over his shoulder. The slender man behind him and to his left was less armored than he was, just a leather breastplate, mostly hidden by the dark gray tunic he wore over the top. His pants were light brown, tight-fitting, and tucked into calf-high, turned-down boots. 
He wore a pack on his back, and a gray skull cap covered most of his head, leaving just a few strands of his blonde hair falling out. His hands rested upon the pommel of his longsword, which he held point down into the dirt before him. What? Hatherley cleared his throat. I would avoid flesh wounds for such as these, he nodded toward the still corpse at his feet, its head was severed from its body, and go for the head instead. Gareth stared at him for a long moment, then rolled his eyes, bent over, grabbed the haft of his axe. No kidding. The axe was stuck fast. This was going to take a bit of work. He stepped over the rotting course and took hold with both hands. You could have helped, you know, if you figured it out so fast. Gareth practically heard Hatherley's shrug. You seem to have things well in hand, my lord. Gareth heaved upward, his breath leaving his lungs in a long grunt as he strained against the axe handle. For several long seconds, nothing happened. Then, without warning, the axe came free. Gareth stumbled backwards, almost tripping over the creature's severed forearm. Decaying corpse matter of some variety or other, Gareth did not want to think about what it was exactly, sprayed out of the thing's head where his axe used to be. He shuddered, trying not to inhale the newly increased stench. Instead, he turned away and stalked further into the cave, pausing only to remove a rag from behind his belt. He wiped the blade of his axe clean of slime, bone, and the rest as he walked. Hatherly followed. I asked you to stop calling me that. I'm no lord, Gareth growled over his shoulder. Again, the semi-audible shrug. Lord Hadley offered a title to whomever rids the country of the necromancer, so I expect you will be soon. Besides, I am sworn to your service, my lord. What else should I call you? Gareth ground his teeth. They had argued this point several times before, and he had never been able to get Hatherly to budge. Best to just let it lie. What do you make of those things? Necromancers are masters of all things dead, my lord. Considering our quest, yes, I know, I just meant, what do you think about them? There was a long pause. My lord? Never mind. The reanimated corpses were clearly watchdogs. That meant Gareth's notion was right. There was a passage from the cave into the necromancer's tower. Hatherley either did not see it or was just playing dumb because that's what he thought a manservant was supposed to do to his lord. It would be less annoying if he was consistent about it, if the latter. The light was beginning to fade. Gareth took a moment to look back. The cave mouth was about 25 feet behind them. The jagged rocks around its entrance really did make it look like a mouth, come to think of it. The floor of the cave was relatively flat, littered here and there with rocks and boulders and two hacked-up corpses. But as far as caves went, it was easy to navigate. Looking back to the passage ahead, the cave bent around to the left. Very soon, the light from the entrance would be gone. Break out the torches, he said. Hatherley nodded acquiescence and took off his pack. He spent a moment digging around before coming up with two of the torches they had made back in town. Gareth set his axe down and took out flint and steel. Hatherley held the torches out toward him and he began to work. In a few moments, both torches were alight and the two men set off once more. Keep a close eye out, Gareth said softly, receiving only a short grunt in return. Glancing aside, Gareth noted an expression of annoyance on Hatherley's face that disappeared as soon as the other man felt his eyes on him. He had to suppress a grin. It was not often that Hatherley let his facade crack. The cave continued to twist to the left and ascended. It gradually became more narrow and the ceiling lowered as well. The small pools of light cast by their torches only heightened the sense that the world was slowly closing in on them. Gareth felt the hair on his arms stand on end and he began to get a queasy feeling in his stomach. He had to force himself to breathe normally, but nonetheless he felt a deepening pressure on his chest. He had never cared for tight spaces. Finally, the passage leveled, though it became noticeably more rough, with more rounded boulders strewn hither and yon, along with the occasional stalactite and stalagmite. Then there was the whisper of moving air. Gareth would not have noticed it except for the stillness of the rest of the cave. The slight breeze carried with it the odor of dampness, with a hint of corruption beneath. Gareth rolled his shoulders, settling the shield he kept slung on his back a bit more comfortably. Then, flexing his hands on the haft of his axe, he stepped around a particularly large boulder, and found himself flailing his arms to keep from falling as his foot came down on only empty air. Only Hatherley's quick reaction, grabbing his shoulder and hauling him back, prevented disaster. Shivering from a surge of adrenaline, Gareth exhaled deeply and nodded thanks. Hatherley returned the nod but said nothing. His eyes said enough. Gareth needed to be more careful. It would not do for Hatherley to lose his lord this quickly into his tenure as Gareth's sworn man. 
Gareth managed not to scowl at the man before he turned back to the fall that had almost taken him, and his heart sank. The floor dropped away on the other side of the boulder, becoming a sheer crevasse that descended further than the torch's light could reach. The crack ran in both directions as far as he could see and was about 15 feet wide, too far to jump. Except for a narrow ledge leading off to the left on his side of the crevasse, there was no way forward. That is discouraging, Heatherly said as he eyed the crack. That's one way to say it. I didn't see any branching passages or anything that looked like a door, did you? Heatherly shook his head. Gareth sighed and stepped to the left-hand wall, where the ledge lay. It was about two feet wide and proceeded on for quite some distance, well past the illumination from the torches. It was not a very inviting route. I'm not sure I like the notion of sliding along that ledge, but I don't see any other way to go, Gareth said. He glanced back at Hatherley. What do you think? The slender man shrugged. I go where you go, my lord. Great help, that one. Gareth sighed. All right, let's go. With a deep breath, he inched his foot out onto the ledge. It was too narrow to walk properly, not without great risk of overbalancing and falling, so he pressed his back against the cave wall and slid along sideways. It was slow going and awkward. Very quickly in the process, he switched his axe to his left hand, the one that was leading the way, and the torch into his right. At least he would have a better chance of defending himself that way, and he was not staring directly into the torch's flame. At one point, Gareth's foot came down on the very lip of the ledge, and part of it broke away. He pressed himself back more tightly against the wall, expecting the rest of the ledge to fall away beneath him at any moment. The various prayers that he had not spoken since he was a boy flew through his mind as he awaited the end, and he felt a cold sweat beating on his brow. But the rest of the ledge held. And after a long moment, Hatherley cleared his throat, rousing Gareth from his near-panicked state. He shook himself and blinked, then managed a rueful grin and continued on. Finally, after what felt like forever, but was probably only a few hundred feet, the wall expanded back into an oblong alcove that almost appeared carved out of the rock face it was so smooth. About twenty feet deep and half again as many wide, the walls were rounded, rising to meet in a sort of dome in the center of the alcove area. Aside from that, however, the alcove was unremarkable and empty. The walls were bare rock with no protuberances, the floor smooth and level. Even the ledge did not continue beyond the alcove. This was it. End of the road. Damn it, Gareth muttered. I thought for sure there was a way. The presence of our previous adversary certainly suggested as much, my lord, Heatherly replied, though I hesitate to imagine beings like those successfully navigating that ledge. Gareth was forced to nod in agreement. He had been wondering that himself as he crept down the ledge. Those walking corpses were not particularly nimble. How had they managed to not fall off the ledge? Of course, there was nothing to stop the necromancer from simply bringing them in through the cave mouth. But why go to all the effort to do so, if the only thing in the cave was this? There's got to be more here than meets the eye, Gareth said. Take left, Hatherly. I'll start on the right. We'll meet in the middle. He did not wait for the manservant to respond, but strode over to the far end of the alcove. Moving slowly, he tapped the flat of his axe against the cave wall. A metallic tink rang out, almost eclipsing the softer ring of the stone as the metal touched it. Not particularly melodious, but true. The wall was solid there. Gareth continued in that manner, ranging up and down the wall at random as he eased his way around the alcove, until he met Hatherly halfway around as planned. Anything? The manservant just shrugged. Sounds solid to me, my lord. Hmm. Gareth frowned at the stone wall for a long moment, his thoughts whirling. He'd been so sure. The wasted time and effort rankled, but more than that, the thought that another may have already breached the tower's walls ahead of him drove a spike of irritation that bordered on rage into him. If I may suggest, stow it, Hatherly, Gareth could not help himself from shouting. Hatherly blanched and drew back on himself, his already slight frame seeming to shrivel as he recoiled from his lord's anger. His lord. Gareth had no claim to that title, nor did he want one. Why would the little fellow not listen when he explained that? It was almost enough to bring full on rage for a moment. Then Gareth got a hold of himself and forced himself back to calm. Or at least just more than mild irritation. He knew exactly why Hatherly had sworn to him, why he called Gareth his lord, and Gareth did not have the heart to force that devotion from him. He drew a deep breath and forced the last of his anger away. I'm sorry, Hatherly, he said, making his tone as kind as he could. Hatherly blinked. He actually looked confused. No need to apologize, my lord. I serve at your pleasure. How to explain? 
The issue almost made Gareth angry again, but he was back in control. Never mind, let's go. We'll take the short, direct way, straight through the front door. He barked out a laugh that he hoped sounded confident. That old necromancer will never expect something like that. Gareth turned and walked back toward the ledge, his earlier trepidation about taking it forgotten, at least for the moment. The sound of Hatherly clearing his throat brought him to a halt. Gareth looked back at Hatherly over his shoulder. What? Hatherly gave the slightest of shrugs. I go where you go, my lord, but... Out with it, man. Hatherly frowned. Not to contradict you, but I suspect the necromancer expects that very thing. He counts on it, and has his defenses arrayed against it. The odds of success or even survival in a frontal assault are... Never tell me the odds. Hatherly's teeth clicked together, and he managed a rueful smile. Pardon, my lord, I forgot. Gareth looked at the slender manservant for half a minute, then rolled his eyes and threw up his hands. Well, what do you suggest? My lord, I would not presume. Gareth's stare carried daggers. Hatherly's speech slowed, and it came to a halt beneath its weight. Finally, he made a vague gesture toward the top of the ceiling where the dome reached its zenith. Gareth frowned and walked over to the center of the alcove. As he stepped beneath the ceiling's zenith, it was like a key turning a lock. He suddenly saw what Hatherly was referring to. Standing exactly there, the patterns of the rock came together and formed a sigil of a wolf biting the neck of a fallen deer. The sigil of the necromancer, Gareth presumed. The wolf's eyes were open. They stared behind Gareth and to his right, toward the stone floor. Gareth turned around and looked down toward where the wolf was gazing. There he saw a circle, surrounded by a five-pointed star, inlaid into the ground. He felt his eyes growing wide as his jaw dropped. Hatherly, he began, then he caught himself as a realization hit him. He rounded on the slender man, his earlier anger rekindled. You knew? Hatherly shook his head. I saw the sigil in the ceiling, yes. Why the hell didn't you say anything? Gareth felt his heart rate beginning to climb. I was sure you would find it, my lord. He smiled, his smile becoming pure admiration and devotion. It was not my place to interrupt. Gareth bit back a curse, instead grinding his teeth to keep a vicious tongue lashing from spewing forth. He glared at Hatherly for a minute. The man did not even have the grace to look embarrassed, then sighed and looked back at the star in circle on the ground. Well, what do you make of this? Hatherly walked up next to Gareth, his expression curious. When he stopped beneath the sigil on the ceiling and followed Gareth's pointed finger with his gaze, his eyes widened. I do not see that, my lord, he began. His lips pursed together. Interesting. As you well know, that symbol is used by magicians and wizards everywhere as a center of a summoning circle. Gareth knew no such thing, but he did know better than to interrupt Hatherly when he went on a tear. He nodded, putting on an encouraging grin, or at least one he hoped was encouraging. But Hatherly seemed to not notice as he kept her right on talking. The symbol's power constrains the beings the wizard summons, allows him a certain amount of control during the meeting. Hatherly's tongue clicked behind his front teeth. I suspect a necromancer would be especially comfortable with this symbol. The dead are quite unhappy when disturbed. He cleared his throat. Or so I hear. Gareth supposed Hatherly's last comment made sense. Sort of. So now we know the necromancer was here at some point. Gareth left the area beneath the ceiling zenith and stepped toward the symbol on the floor. He half expected the symbol to fade from his vision when he left the zenith, but it did not. It was as though once unlocked, the symbols were easily seen. On a hunch, he looked back up at the zenith. The wolf sigil was still there. Yep, whatever it was that had prevented him from seeing it before was gone. Gareth wished that did not make him feel so frightened. He crouched down and examined the symbol. From up close, it almost certainly appeared to be etched into the floor. But that did not make any sense. If it had been, he would have seen it before. Sitting his axe down, he ran his fingers along the symbol. Sure enough, the lines of the star in the circle were recessed into the stone floor. I'll be damned, Gareth muttered. I should hope not, my lord. Hatherly's ears were entirely too keen sometimes. Rather than respond, Gareth just grunted and went back to examining the symbol. The edges of the lines were abrupt, hardly weathered at all, which is not surprising considering how little traffic came through this cave. All the same, that meant they had been made relatively recently. Gareth traced out the lines of the symbol again more slowly. There was something... Well, how about that? Gareth looked up at Hatherly. The engraving is a bit deeper at each point of the star, see? Hatherly frowned slightly and crouched down next to Gareth. After a moment, he nodded. Indeed, my lord, and it looks like there is something embedded within it as well. 
Gareth blinked and lowered his head to examine the points of the star more closely. As he did so, he moved the torch, now back in his left hand, and he saw a glint of reflected light off of one of the points. Is that metal? Hatherly shrugged. It does appear so, my lord. Gareth bit his lip and thought for a moment. This was becoming more and more interesting. Clearly, the necromancer had left this symbol here and gone to no small amount of effort to do so. Maybe... Maybe it's like a doorknob, he said, voicing his thoughts aloud. Hatherly shrugged, but did not reply. Gareth glanced at him and sighed. Sometimes the man's penchant for speaking his thoughts became annoying, but he was knowledgeable about many things. Scholars and sages were useful that way. But he seemed to pick the strangest times to go silent, and that was almost more annoying. Back up, Hatherly, I'm going to try something, and I have no idea what it's going to do. As you wish, my lord. The slender man stood up and moved over to the wall. Gareth noted he was right near the ledge, no doubt ready to make a quick escape if things went badly wrong. Smart man. Here goes nothing. Gareth kept a dagger sheathed on his belt, opposite the iron ring that he slugged the haft of his axe through when he did not want to carry it. He withdrew the dagger, hardly noticing the familiar sound of steel drawing against hardened leather, and paused. Where to begin? There were no markings to make any one point of the star more important than another, no indication of where to start and where to end. If Gareth had put this little contraption together, he would make sure to have some horrible thing happen to a person who did not execute it correctly. It only made sense the necromancer would have done the same. But there was no way to know that without trying, was there? I'm a sodding fool, he muttered. Then he pressed the tip of his dagger into the lower right point on the star. Scarlet light, somehow beautiful despite its unearthly hue, began shining from the point as soon as the steel of the dagger made contact. The glow continued after Gareth removed the dagger, but nothing untoward occurred. He must be on the right track, because he was not dead. Yet. Moving with careful slowness, he pressed the tip of the dagger into the remaining four points of the star. Each time, the points began glowing just as the first one did. As he removed the dagger from the final point, Gareth felt a certain satisfaction and he grinned. Turns out this little riddle was not so difficult after all. He rocked back on his heels and his grin faded. The points of the light were dimmer, or was that his imagination? No, no, they were dimmer. What? The lights went out. Damn it, what the hell just happened? Hatherly was next to him again. Gareth had not noticed his approach, so caught up in the moment had he been. He had to resist the urge to slap himself. That was the sort of carelessness that could get them both killed. I suspect, Hatherly began, rubbing his chin with the fingers of his left hand, that you are correct about this device's purpose, my lord. It may well open a portal of some sort. But it will need to work as a whole, not as a collection of individual parts. Gareth blinked. Come again? Hatherly gave him a look that said he was missing the forest for the trees. The star is a series of lines, not a set of five points. The realization hit Gareth in a flash. Idiot. He shouldn't have needed Hatherly to come to that conclusion. Grumbling, Gareth thrust the tip of his dagger into the lower right point on the star. This time he did not remove the dagger, but instead traced the star out, line by line and point by point, until he had completed the entire thing. As he did, the glow began from the first point that continued down the line to the second, getting brighter as it went. By the time he was tracing out the line between the fourth and fifth points, the glow was bright enough that he had to squint to avoid being dazzled. Done. Gareth pulled his dagger from its engraving, and the circle began glowing on its own, a blue glow this time that complemented the star's crimson, but also added to the glare so much that he had to look away. He saw Hatherly shielding his eyes with a raised hand, a look of surprised awe on his face. Then the light flicked out, leaving them both in blackness. At first, Gareth thought he was blind. The light, as bright as it was, had overcome him completely. He had turned away too slowly, and he was doomed to live out the rest of his life in darkness, begging passers-by for whatever coins or scraps they deigned to share with him. It was almost enough to make him open up a vein with a dagger in his hand. After a minute or so, though, he realized he could see, ever so slightly. There was a light, extremely faint, streaming in from somewhere off to his right, he thought. It was difficult to tell, because the light was so dim he almost thought he was imagining it at first. Once, when Gareth was young, he had locked himself inside a padded chest while playing hide-and-seek. He almost died of suffocation before his parents finally found him, but while he waited, he experienced near-total silence. The padding of the chest blocked the outside noise so well that he could not hear anything. 
After a short while, he began imagining he heard things. Dogs barking, laughter, whispers, the sort of faint whispers that would drive a man mad if he listened to them for too long. The light he experienced now reminded him of that day, and he felt a cold shiver of fear run down his spine. Swallowing to repress the bile he knew would come up if he let it, he pushed himself to his feet. Hatherly, Gareth said, trying not to let his sudden fear show in his tone. Are you still there? There was silence for a moment, then a discontented snort announced the manservant's presence. Here, my lord, that was most instructive. Hatherly normally was extremely pleased to learn something. Remnants of his old profession, no doubt. Not this time. He sounded positively chagrined. Not that Gareth felt much better. Sheathing his dagger, he peered around, trying to get his bearings, and failed. Then, all at once, he realized he still felt grainy wood in his left hand. The torch. He had not extinguished it, so why was it not shining? Gingerly, Gareth raised his right hand to the end of the torch where the flame should have been. He felt no heat, even when he closed his hand around it. The top of the torch crumpled, ash falling away where the fuel and underlying wood had burned, but aside from that, he would never have been able to tell the thing had ever been lit as cool as it was. What the... It would seem, Hatherly said, that our quarry is a bit more clever than you give him credit for. There's a brief pause before he added, My lord. Clearly he was rethinking his pledge of service. Or he was just annoyed because he did not see this turn of events coming either. Gareth would not give odds either way. Wonderful. Gareth tossed the torch, useless now, to the ground. Then he crouched back down and felt around until he found his axe. Feeling a bit better with the weapon's solid weight in his right hand, he stood back up and shrugged his shield off his back, then slipped it onto his left forearm. What was making that light? Gareth turned his head left and right, but no matter which way he looked, it was all the same. Just darkness illuminated by the faintest hint of light, just enough to remind him he was not blind. He could find no source see no details. But there had to be something there. He rolled his shoulders and straightened. He found himself hunching over without realizing it, an instinctual response to the oppressing gloom, no doubt. Hatherly grabbed the back of my belt. He did not wait for the other man to respond. He just stepped forward, trusting in Hatherly's seemingly instinctive need to obey. Gareth felt a reassuring tug on his belt as he moved forward. Hatherly had grabbed onto it before it was too late. One direction was as good as another, so he continued forward in as straight a line as he could manage. It would be very easy to get turned around with no visual reference, but there was nothing else to it. And he had always been good at walking along logs, even with his eyes closed. Sooner or later, if he kept straight enough, he had to run into something. Sure enough, he did exactly that. Well, moment, he was walking slowly forward. The next, he found himself falling, his outstretched foot having come down on nothing but thin air. The cry of chagrin from behind him and the desperate tugging at the back of his belt told him that Hatherly, too, had fallen, but he had only enough time to throw his axe aside. It would not do to land on it and impale himself before he struck ground. Hard. A heartbeat later, Hatherly landed on top of him. Gareth's breath left his lungs in a rush, and the momentary lack of breath clouded his other pains for a time. Finally, when he was able to inhale again, he took stock. He hurt all over. He had landed flat on his belly, spreading the impact all over his body. A small mercy, that. Had he landed any other way, he would likely be nursing one or more broken bones. But after a short consideration, Gareth decided he would have bruises pretty much everywhere. But he was functional, if that was the right word for it. Get off me, he said, his voice harsher than he intended it between his aches and difficulty breathing. It was only after Hatherly rolled off and Gareth forced himself up onto his hands and knees that he realized he could see again. Or rather, that the light was bright enough that he could make out his surroundings without difficulty. He almost wished he could not. He and Hatherly were in a small room, maybe ten feet on the side. Although room was probably a misnomer, all around him were steel bars beyond which he could make out little of the chamber beyond. The floor was rock as was the ceiling, and how did that work exactly? He could see no hint of the hole he fell through, though it must have been there. Bugger me, he breathed. He looked around again. Whether it was because the light grew more bright or because his eyes were becoming more accustomed to it, he found he could see the chamber housing his cell a bit better. It was made of stone, chiseled blocks that fit together tightly enough that he wondered whether the builders had bothered with mortar and was empty, save for their cell. And his axe, lying about five feet beyond the walls of the cell off to the right. Bugger me, he said more emphatically. 
Not even if you paid me, my lord, said Hatherley as he pushed himself to his feet. He took a moment to brush himself off, smoothing his clothing at the same time as he looked around. Well, he said, this is rather discouraging. He had a way with words, Hatherley did. Right, so as the title of this episode shows, this is not the end of the story. This is a novella, a short novella. It's 18, 19,000 words. So it take about two hours to go through in totality. And I don't want to... I've made long videos before and long podcasts before, but I want to keep it shorter, around 30 minutes or so. So as going for, that seems like a better length. So we'll be breaking this up over the next couple weeks to get the whole thing done. Hope you don't mind. And we left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger there. Well, geez, they're in a cell. What are they going to do? Oh my gosh, are they dead? Well, you'll find out. They're not dead yet. But they are facing a necromancer, so you never know. So anyway, I hope you liked that. If you did, you know what to do. Go buy the book. Go buy all the books. MichaelKingswood.com slash store is the best place to go because it comes directly to my business. And so that cuts out the middleman and I get more profit that way. You still get all the functionality you want. The way it's set up, the ebooks will get delivered straight to your device. Uh, print books will get shipped straight to your house. And audiobooks, you can get the download for. Uh, it's in M4P format, the audiobooks. Obviously, this one isn't audiobook sized yet because we're currently reading it. Uh, but once it's done, it will be available and other books in audiobook form are available there too. For the audiobook, you got to download it and put it on your device yourself. Sorry. If you prefer though to go through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Google Play, iBooks and a hundred million other retailers out there, you can do that. Find all my stuff. Uh, MichaelKingswood.com slash books to read the number two will get you to a universal aggregator where you can click on one of my books and it'll take you to the story that you want and you can go from there. So, two options. MichaelKingswood.com slash store to the SSN Storytelling Web Store is the best one. Okay, now, what else is going on? Uh, we are continuing on with the 52 Stories in 2023 project. Uh, this week we are doing story number, I want to say, 31. It's 30 or 31. Uh, and... Uh, that is proceeding on a nonce. The, we are in the middle of uh, doing, starting fulfillment for the second Kickstarter for Volume 2, which uh, the Kickstarter ended at the end of June, and we are going to have everything out, you know, knock on wood, to everybody by the end of July. Uh, the surveys have gone out to all the Kickstarter backers. I'm just waiting on a couple people to finish them, and then we'll commence shipping. Uh, now, the next volume volume three if you've done the math we're doing story 30 or 31 this week so the story is all ready for that so we're going to run kickstarter number three for the year here starting on august 1st that will be obviously at kickstarter you can the page for it is open now so you can follow it so you get a notification as soon as it's ready to go michaelkingswood.com slash 52 in 23 v3 will get you there where you can search for it on kickstarter but the just follow the link i just said it'll make it easier and so follow that you'll get notified as soon as it's live i of course will tell everybody under the sun when it is ready to go uh but the more people who follow it now and the more people who back it as soon as it starts uh will make it better for me for goosing kickstarter algorithms and maybe they'll take notice of it and give it more attention and i get more money so that's what's going on uh so go, moving forward for the next two probably maybe three weeks uh we'll be finishing up necromancer and then we'll move on to the next uh, story that I did back in the day. Uh, and uh, we'll continue on through that for the next uh, you know, couple months till I get sick of it. And then we'll eventually we'll get to Glimmervale 3. But speaking of Glimmervale, um, I got asked by a dude last week who has read all my stuff and loves them when the next Glimmervale book, Glimmervale 7, is going to come out. And that's something that I <laughs> have been pondering and working over in my head for a little bit here because i've been focusing on this short story challenge and i've been working the space navy book but i have it's like man the reveal series is continuing i have to write the next one and i want to get that done before the end of the year in fact at this point i am 
thinking about so what we're looking at for the 52 stories challenge and upcoming kickstarters is this kickstarter for the volume three will be in august assuming it all goes well volume four will be ready to go uh, all the stories will be written by the end of september so we'll get that kickstarter going in yeah, probably mid-september and then we'll do the final volume five culmination effort in january after everything's done right um well so that means i've got some time in november december to run another campaign so i think we're going to target the gloomer veil vale seven campaign to launch that book for mid-november ish um there is obviously it's contingent on me getting it done or at least mostly done by then uh which is totally doable just yeah, sit down and do it but that is the plan going forward for the rest of the year next year i've already i've got some notions of what uh next year is going to hold but i'm going to hold off talking about that until you know the fall because <laughs> i want to make sure i don't goon, it, goon up my 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 uh my process this year first and make sure i deliver everything that i've said i'm going to okay so anyway if you haven't already subscribe to this channel or this podcast wherever you're listening or watching it on you better do that now if you haven't liked this video or this podcast episode do that now too and tell all your buddies about it so we can grow the audience because if you grow the audience hopefully more people will buy books because the whole point of this is to grift grifting the books because they're good books all right good stuff and it's not just because i'm an ego not just because my mom tells me it's good other people tell me it's good too and you will like it so go get some and tell all your buddies okay we're done yeah i'm gonna sign off now you have a great rest of the weekend and i will talk to you next saturday for the second part of the necromancer's lair until then don't do anything i wouldn't do